good evening ladies and gentlemen hearty welcome to the 43rd session in, in our learn from the legends international webinar series in neonatology organized by nnf kerala and iap neonatology chapter it's indeed a an honor to have professor ann hatstorm professor of pediatric ophthalmology sahi granska academy sweden who will speak to us on advances in the management of retinopathy of prematurity this session will be moderated by air commodore samshir singh dalal professor armed forces medical college pune and professor ls deshmukh gmc aurangabad once again a warm welcome to the eminent faculty and all participants thank you very much over to dr manoj vc hello everyone hearty welcome today we have professor anil hellstrom an outstanding researcher in the field of pediatric ophthalmology to deliver the 43rd lecture in our international webinar series professor hellstrom as we all know is a world is world famous for a work on retinopathy of prematurity a leading cause of childhood blindness she has approached the research field of rop using several techniques that's remarkable developing innovative and reliable tools to optimize the prediction of infants at risk demonstrating important mechanisms of pathogenesis discovering new innovative therapies to prevent rop and evaluating these in clinical trials since 1987 professor health Hestrom has been passionate in research and has published over 200 papers in international scientific journals and has an H index of 57 with over 12,500 citations. As some of us know already, she in a landmark paper together with Professor Lois Smith published in PNAS in 2001 showed in a mouse model that low IGF-1 suppressed wedge of survival signaling in retiti, retiti, uh, retinal endothelial cells and went on there, therefore to show that this was directly correlated with the development of clinical rop this early results we all know paved the way for a series of important papers in this century uh, confirming that igf1 is critical for normal vascularization of the retina and that igf1 deficiency is associated with rop both in animals and humans and the igf bp3 prevents rop development and actually friends that is the reason why we decided we should request her valuable time here and have her somehow in our series and today we have the legend with us friends we all know in the subsequent years post this discovery professor hellstrom has also shown that the poor early growth of preterm infants reflecting low igf1 levels is a strong predictor of rop risk this actually led to clinical trials evaluating the possibility of using igf1 replacement therapy to prevent rop development in preterm infants Professor Hellstrom has published the first report on pharmacokinetics of IGF-1, IGF-BP3 treatment in preterm infants. And this treatment is currently evaluated, we all know, in a large international multicentral trial we all caught here and there. Let me take the liberty to elaborate a few more inventions of her. It's, the, it's too many. I just sum, I'll just summarize uh, in few words. Uh, I don't want to stand between you and the legend. after discovering the connection between igf1 growth fact grow, growth and rop professor elstrom also started to investigate the role of early nutrition on rop development in preterm infants in a seminal paper from 2007 together with again the same um, legend professor loy smith she showed that omega 3 poly pufa suppressed retinopathy and she established the spe specific metabolites affecting the suppression this has prompted two swedish multicentral trials if i am sure, uh, not mistaken investigating the effects of different intakes of omega 6 and 3 pufa uh, including dha and ara with very promising outcomes on rop which we will hear from her today friends 
these are only examples of the scope and impact of professor hellstrom's research contributions his studies are a perfect example of collaborative together with professor lois smith translational bends to bedside research translational research using discoveries made in experimental models to develop treatments implement Im, implemented in clinical practice that's what we all want the actual research results have generated several patterns i am sure including computer algorithms for predicting rop development something i hope she will enlighten us today professor hellstrom has received numerous awards including the athena award in 2012 a prestigious recognition of leading to uh, clinical implementations in 2012 she received uh, european union funding of 6 million euros for the project prevent rop prevent rop and we all know in 2019 she received valenberg clinical scholars an extremely prestigious program that provides funding over 10 years for some of the country's most foremost clinical researchers in sweden professor hellstrom is not only a world leading researcher in ophthalmology why we know her because her research on preterm infants has also made as a real leading researcher in neonatology her research has led to improvements in the care of preterm infants and ongoing clinical trials are ev evaluating the further clinical uh, be uh, benefits of clinical treatments rop we all know is a significant cause of childhood blind blindness especially with the new smaller and smaller preemies ridiculously low birth weight babies surviving and because the survival rates uh ex of extremely premature infants are improving the frequency of this devastating condition also is increasing especially with the survival of this it uh, borrow uh, professor martin kessler's words ridiculously low birth weight infants professor hellstrom's research has had a very significant impact in the field as she has been a leading contributor to various things like development of new tools and guidelines for clinical optimization important advances in our understanding of pathophysiology and clinical trials evaluating the effects of possible agents to prevent rop friends i can go on and on uh, that probably i would not be doing justice to the time we spent together uh, i am sure that all of us know she is a true legend in this field and we are so fortunate to have you madam with us professor hellstrom thank you so much over to you madam thank you very much thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation on advances in the management of rop It is a true honor to be among the legends that have speak before me. So as a pediatric ophthalmologist, this is what we do at the university clinics approximately twice a week. We examine the babies for looking how the vasculature develops in the retina. Uh before the invention of um, the retinal uh, photography we used indirect ophthalmoscopy as this by giving a dilating drop using a, a, a magnifying glass we could see how the vessels grew from the back of the eye towards the lens and in approximately 70% of the babies it looked like this what we see here where you can see that the vessels uh, grow perfectly normal from the optic disc towards the periphery However, in about 30% of the babies we see this. We can see an abnormal retinal vascularization where we can identify the unvascularized retina and the vascular part of the retina. In another in another approximately 7 to 10%, we have to treat the babies. This is a baby with aggressive ROP that was very heavily treated with laser. And every yellow spot you see here is a laser burn on the retina. And as you can understand, this is a destructive treatment, but the save it saves the child from becoming blind. And of course, this baby will have a reduced visual field. 
And as we heard, ROP is still one of the main causes for childhood blindness. And approximately 20,000 babies become blind every year because of ROP. In Sweden, we have now since over 10 years had a, a national patient registry where every baby screened for ROP is collected. We have now more than 12,000 babies. And by doing that, we now know about the natural history of this disease. And as I mentioned, about 70% of the babies do never get any ROP. And about 30% do get some stage of ROP. And in Sweden, approximately 6 to 7% are treated. This figure varies dependent on the neonatal care the baby perceives. But as we also heard, we now save, or you as neonatologists, you save younger and younger and more immature babies. And that results in more babies that get the severe disease that needs treatment. We have shown this in Sweden, and it has also been shown in other parts of the world where neonatology care is uh, at its, its forefront. So why are we so interested in ROP? Why is, is ROP important for neonatologists? Well, I think most of you are aware that ROP is one of the strongest biomarkers for later outcome in these babies, especially neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric outcome. And that is not so strange as the retina is part of the brain. And by looking how the vessels grow on the retina, we can actually also follow how the brain grows. So this leads to the first question I have. Uh, what about ROP and its pathophysiology? Is it a vascular disease, a neural disease, or a neurovascular disease? Please vote. So you are all very well trained because as, sent, as seen, it is a neurovascular disease. Before it was mostly considered a vascular disease, but it is absolutely a neurovascular disease. Can we move on? It seems as I cannot scroll on after this. Is it ma'am? Let me just, you are not able to, please try now. Yeah. No, it won't move forward now. One second ma'am. Yeah. Can you try now, ma'am? No, nothing happens. Uh, I think they must have got frozen at that point, ma'am. Can you just uh, stop sharing and re again start sharing, ma'am? Because I, there is something I'm not able to do from here. Okay, so I stop sharing and I come back. Uh, please uh, again start sharing, ma'am. So, yep, thank you, and now it works. So actually it is a neurovascular disease and uh, by defining that it was found from histological studies that on the border between the vascular and unvascular area, it was actually the astrocyte precursors who produced VGF and, and uh, contributed to the pathological neovascularization. 
So as it is a, a neurovascular disease, and we know that uh, the preterm babies have a microstructural changes in the brains, not only uh, focal brain lesions like uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, but we know by today that, that they have uh, an also abnormal brain configuration. So at our university, we have unique possibilities to, to study a brain injury biomarker in very, very small volumes. And by doing that, the, we wanted to study the brain biomarker neurofilament light that has been shown in, in, for instance, boxers and in people that have been out in space to be uh, much higher than in a normal population. And you can see the green line, uh, dotted line in the uh, bottom of this figure, which corresponds to values below that is normal levels in adults. And we found in the preterm babies that the levels of this brain biomarker was severely increased during the first month of life. And uh, looking at uh, different uh, neonatal variables to see what was correlated to this increase, we found, in fact, that the only factor uh, of uh, morbidity factor and nutritional factor was ROP. So if the babies had any kind of ROP, which is the red dotted line here, we found that the babies uh, had increased levels of this brain injury biomarker. And in fact, it was, of course, the most immature babies that had the highest levels, but even after adjusting for gestational age, the finding was still persistent. So uh, for sure, uh, looking at how the vessels grow on the retina, we can get a picture of how the brain is doing in the, the corresponding baby. Uh, everyone, when it comes to prevention, knows that oxygen is a main player, key player. And of course, delivering uncontrolled oxygen levels, even at more mature levels of the babies, they can get ROP, as we have seen in several countries. Uh, when the large boost study was published, many neonatal units increased their target ranges, as did we in Sweden. And after doing that, we found a 50% increase in the most severe forms of ROP. So we were interested in finding out why these babies uh, actually developed, what components of oxygen were uh, responsible for this increase. So we looked at uh, almost 2000 babies, which had very high resolution data. And we actually found that it was in the babies that uh, had severe ROP, they had actually lower mean oxygenation, but they had a much higher variability. And this has also been shown by others that it is actually the variability that is the crucial factor. And of course, if you have a very immature and sick baby, it's more difficult to, to keep it on a higher target range. And thereby the baby usually have a bigger variability of oxygen saturation. Uh, today in Sweden and in mon many units, there is one um, uh, standard for uh, oxygen targets and oxygen delivery, independent of gestational age, of postmenstrual age, of sex, of uh, if the baby has anemia or not, and of also regarding the proportion of fetal hemoglobin. And I believe in the future that this is a perfect area for personalized medicine, because all these factors we know contribute to how the baby is oxygenated. So I think there is a large improvement to be made here, but unfortunately, large randomized trials looking at these uh, entities does not exist today, but it is really, really wanted. One factor that we know plays a role in oxygenation is, as I said, the blood components. So this uh, brings me to the next question. We'll see if this works. Uh, looking at, at uh, risk factors for ROP, do you believe that it is the number of blood transfusions that is the main risk factor, or is it the cause of transfusions, namely the anemia? 
So time to make a vote again. Okay, so I'm happy I can contribute a bit here because uh, actually looking at the literature, it is most of the time stated that it is the number of blood transfusions. However, I do not believe that is correct. It is rather the reason for blood transfusions, namely the early anemia. I think I have to stop share again and go back because it won't. doesn't want to work with me now. Okay, so we did show a couple of years ago that looking at um, try to titrate out uh, which was the most important, we found that very early anemia was the most prominent uh, risk factor rather than the transfusions itself. Uh, and it is interesting that it is this early anemia that actually is uh, associated with a retinal abnormal vascularizations months after this early low anemia. And uh, we did a study in Sweden to try to figure out why the reason for anemia. And of course, that is multifactorial. But one very, very strong risk factor for anemia is the iatrogenic phlebotomy that is ongoing in, at, in the neonatal wards. And in fact, we were quite surprised when we found out that during the first two weeks, at two uh, university hospitals in Sweden, approximately 57% of the blood volume was lost because of iatrogenic phlebotomy. That would be corresponding to if any one of us would end up in the new, uh, intensive care unit and we would lo lose over three liters of blood. So it's a substantial blood volume that is lost. And um, one thing that is lost uh, when taking early blood samples in these babies is, uh, of course, the fetal blood components. And we were interested in looking at fetal hemoglobin, as that is for sure associated with oxygenation in these babies. And we found that the, the faster the baby drops in fetal hemoglobin, which is seen on the figure to your left, um, are the babies with any ROP, the higher, the, the faster that the babies drop in fetal hemoglobin, the higher the risk for any ROP. And here is the fetal hemoglobin uh, week one, the mean values week one. And you can see that there is a drastic uh, change in the risk for ROP depending how much fetal hemoglobin you have. In a term baby, you it takes approximately two to three months to go from around 70% of fetal hemoglobin down to around 20%. But here you can see that this was really speeded on and only after one week, the levels had uh, decreased to approximately 50% in the babies with NROP. And of course, this has an impact on the oxygenation. And of course, the more blood we take uh, from the baby, the more um, transfusions are given when it comes to, this was when we looked at er erythrocyte transfusions. And um, one could only speculate in what other factors the babies uh, do have a change in when we exchange the fetal blood with adult blood. Uh, for instance, all the plasma that is given to neonates is from male donors, as there is a too high of a risk to give um, 
plasma from female donors because of, of uh, the immuno immunological reaction that might take place. And we know uh, from studies that, for instance, sex steroids are uh, tremendously different in the plasma that is given to these babies uh, when compared with uh, the female babies, especially. So um, I was quite interesting to, to see this uh, publication from September this year that actually had looked at the uh, sex of the donator when it came to red blood cells. And in fact, uh, most uh, neonatal morbidities, except from ROP, uh, had a reduced uh, uh, frequency when the donation was from female uh, red blood cell donors. So it seems as it has an impact uh, from where the, the, in this case, red blood cells are coming, but probably also uh, the composition of the plasma of the babies that when they are being transfused. So this uh, led us to uh, starting to speculate whether uh, we actually could transfuse uh, rather uh, erythrocytes from cord blood uh, rather than from adults. So we have a project named NeoRed where we now have produced a component of uh, cord blood uh, erythrocytes that we know contain approximately 77% of fetal hemoglobin compared to in, in adult blood where it is actually less than 1%. And we will now start a phase one study to uh, look at safety when delivering fetal erythrocytes to preterm babies. There are actually a couple of studies that has performed this uh, without any safety concerns. So this might be one way to maintain uh, at least fetal hemoglobin in these neonates. We have also shown that uh, the levels of fetal hemoglobin is strongly associated not only with ROP, but also with BPD. And uh, looking at uh, the proteome of extremely preterm babies, we did a pilot in 14 babies. We have now looked at 220 babies and we have exactly the same findings, namely that most of the proteins associated with ROP belongs to the group of hematopoiesis, which again points at the importance of blood components uh, when it comes to neurovascular growth in these babies. And of course, also uh, proteins associated with angiogenesis and uh, neurogenesis, as well as immune function. So, uh, as we heard, we have also put a lot of uh, energy into predicting uh, which babies are at most risk. As we know that 70% of the babies we screen will never develop any ROP. So we, we are exposing these babies for stressful examinations and lots of resources are, are going to this. Uh, screening. Uh, so by, by focusing on the right patient at the right time, we could be more specific and, and um, then use the resources in an optimal way. And so far, uh, most prediction models that are out there are using postnatal weight gain <clears throat> to predict severe ROP. We have now, uh, thanks to a very, very uh, good statistician working in the group, Aldina Pivodic, uh, she has used data from the Swedish patient registry in Norope, the SWED group, and together with the SWED group group, we have uh, gathered information on almost 10,000 babies and developed an algorithm that uh, actually predicts if the baby needs to be screened at all, or if it can be released from screening, depending on, on the outcome from, from the Sweden patient registry. And it is available. Uh, I'm so happy because they made it available uh, to 
uh, before this talk. So you can actually go to, to this homepage and it's free of, of use. And all you have to do is you put in the baby's uh, gestational age in weeks and days, the weight of the baby, the gender of the baby, and then you push calculate. And by doing that, you will compare, I will say compared to the Swedish babies, this model has been validated in an American cohort, in a German cohort, and in a modern Swedish cohort, which was not used to, to, uh, to uh, produce this algorithm. And it has a, a very high sensitivity, uh, almost 100%, and a 55% uh, specificity. So uh, I would suggest you to start to use it and, and, or, and validate it in, 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 in your own settings before using it uh, in the clinic. <clears throat> but for us, it is extremely valued valuable. In this case, this baby is suggested to, to, to screen uh, normally because, as you can see, this is the baby's confidence interval. And the red dot here represents babies in the sweat drop registry that has been treated. The blue area is babies that has not been treated. And this baby has a 5.39 individual risk of needing treatment for ROP. This is compared to this baby born in week 27, weighing 1,100 grams. And this baby is outside the risk of being treated. So according to uh, this algorithm in Sweden, we can safely release this baby from screening. So by putting in only birth characteristics, we could actually release 50% uh, of the babies that we screen today uh, from screening examinations. We are now uh, validating this algorithm and implementing it in the clinic. Um, we have taken this one step further, or our statistician Aldina has taken this one step further and also entered uh, screening data at sign when we see the first sign of ROP and the age of the baby. And by using machine learning, we can reduce another 25% of the babies from screening. So uh, by using this, and this will also come on the home, the page that uh, is, is in the headings here, but uh, not until after Christmas, we will enter the screening information. But for now, uh, you can absolutely use it for birth characteristics, which might be interesting for you as a neonatologist to know if your baby, how high risk it really has to develop ROP. We were interested in looking at the babies that became blind in Sweden to really try to understand what was the reason for this. And doing that, we found that in approximately two thirds of the babies, it was most likely due to that the guidelines had not been followed. For instance, the baby did, was not screened at the time. Uh, it, should, it could have been too sick or misunderstanding of, of uh, the information in the patient uh, rec uh, record, or it was not treated timely when it had uh, signs of being treated or it was not correctly interpreted the, the findings of the ophthalmologists. So um, it, this has also been observed in, in other uh, settings, uh, for instance, in the Canadian network, they uh, proposed that a standardized measurement has to be uh, present in order to avoid unnecessary uh, blindness in these babies. Uh, therefore, we have constructed now a, a digital uh, decision support screening tool where uh, every entity has to be entered into this digital record um, in, in the right eye and the left eye. And by doing that, uh, the ophthalmologist get a suggestion when to screen again or if the baby needs to be treated. 
It is also possible from this uh, digital record to uh, enter the data directly into the Swedish patient registry, which is a fantastic improvement in, in handling uh, the clinical data. So uh, as you also heard, we have become very interested in nutrition and looking at nutrition, uh, I wouldn't um, hesitate to say that the most important uh, nutritional component is uh, mother's own breast milk. And of course, the mother's own breast milk is uh, the quality of that is totally dependent on what the mother uh, eats. And as we have seen that uh, the components of the milk is really reflected in, in the intake of the mother's uh, nutritional. And we have just uh, finalized a study where we have looked at the brains in mice with different nutrition and the uh, offsprings, uh, the offsprings brains when the mothers were given different uh, nutrition and especially different fatty acids. And the, com the composition of the brain is very much uh, reflected by the nutrition of the mother. So <clears throat> this is not a surprise, but it has to be talked about so we can give the mothers the best uh, prerequisites for, for the, if, if they deliver a baby preterm. Uh, and it is not a, about the full amount, but it is actually that any, any, any maternal breast milk is good. A component of maternal breast milk is, of course, fatty acids. And as seen in this slide, during fetal life, the mother um, is actively transporting arachidonic acid to the fetus all uh, over uh, the gestation. And this is especially during the third trimester. And you can see the mother's levels here and the fetus levels here. And this is, of course, the molar percent, but it is higher uh, arachidonic acid in the fetus. And when it comes to DHA, omega-3, this is omega-6, omega-3 is especially increasing in the fetus and reduced in the mo mothers during the end of the third trimester. And we know in the preterm babies that there is a drastic drop in these fatty acids after birth, already after one week, the levels are much lower than during fetal life. And we also know that these factors are important fact fat factors for building tissues. They are uh, responsible for about 60% of the retinal uh, composition and the brain composition and arachidonic acid is extremely important for most membrane structures. Uh, so we did uh, a first a, a trial looking at different parental nutrition and tried to give a, a compound with a fish oil to see whether that would decrease ROP. Uh, we did not see any impact on ROP, but looking at the levels of, of um, fatty acids, we did see that in the babies with severe or any ROP, as in this case, that they had lower arachidonic acid levels. So it seemed from that trial uh, that arachidonic acid was also important for ROP development and not only a DHA. And in looking in the literature, there are quite conflicting results. Sometimes we, it, it has been shown that uh, omega-3s are, are beneficial. And in some studies, uh, that outcome has not been shown. So we performed a, a multi-center trial in Sweden, giving enteral uh, an enteral composition of both arachidonic acid and DHA. Today, there is no parenteral uh, nutrition that contains uh, arachidonic acid and DHA in, in, these, in this uh, composition, two to one. This is approximately the composition that we have uh, during fetal life. And we uh, did this trial in, in 206 babies and ROP was the main outcome. And we did it in approximately 
Uh, it took approximately two years and we finalized the study in end of 2019. And we published our results in February this year. And we did see increased levels of DHA in the group that had this um, parenteral supplementation actually from birth all the way to 40 weeks. And we started with 0.1 mil enterally and uh, it increased slowly to one milliliter uh, in the end uh, when they reached approximately 40 weeks. So we did see significantly higher DHA level, levels, especially in the end of the intervention. And we also did see in increased arachidonic acid levels. And, and uh, we were quite surprised by the finding. Uh, of course, we had hoped for positive effects on ROP, but uh, we did see that we could reduce severe ROP, which was the outcome, and that is ROP stage three, or if the baby needed treatment. And, and the number of infants with severe ROP in the interventional group was reduced by 50%. And this was uh, quite an impact on this treatment. We are at the moment now looking at the MRIs of these babies, and hopefully we will have the outcome of that uh, examination in the beginning of next year. So uh, then trying to do, uh, uh, to try to understand uh, the, the relationship between arachidonic acid and DHA on ROP outcome, we did a secondary analysis that was uh, just published. Um, and we did see actually that uh, the babies with severe ROP had significantly lower arachidonic acid levels. Uh, this is during the first, uh, 12 uh, days, and this is during the first eight days. And this is DHA, they also had lower levels. But what was very interesting, and I think this probably explains why we have so different outcomes in different trials, is that it seemed as um, the impact of DHA was uh, more present uh, if we had a certain level of arachidonic acid. So uh, if the arachidonic acid levels were below in, in our trial, in our setting, it was below approximately 7.7, .7, then we could not see a positive impact of increased DHA. But if we had sufficient arachidonic acid levels, then we could see decreased odds for ROP severity. So it seems as a combination is necessary and as said, a certain level of arachidonic acid is present uh, for DHA to have its, its full action. So what about treatment? Uh, well, as you most of you probably know, laser has been the, the golden standard, but it is now uh, approach by, by anti-VGF. And when it comes to laser, uh, we know for sure that the babies will have a reduced visual field sensitivity. We know that they have an increased risk of myopia. We know that most babies have to be put under general anesthesia. We also know that if it is correctly performed, there is a very low risk of recurrence. Uh, and we have control of long-term outcome. Uh, this is uh, a trial, uh, or it's not a trial, but it is a study that we just performed in Sweden. We looked at all the babies born below 24 weeks, as Sweden is unique in, in um, saving these babies. And we looked at it from 2007 to 2018, and 399 babies survived till 40 weeks that were, yeah ridiculously low birth weight, as we heard before. And we looked at a number of infants that needed a second treatment after laser. And these are the seven university hospitals in Sweden. And as you can see, the dark bar is very, it's a large variation of the dark bar. And that is number of babies that needed retreatment. So it seems as um, 
recurrence is dependent on how the babies are treated with laser. And then we did a new other investigation to look pro what was the reason for this. And I believe it is what you see here. It is if the babies is treating with laser and you have skip lesions. And uh, we now know that uh, in order to do a good laser treatment, you have to do RETCAM in association with the laser treatment. And that is now being done in most centers in Sweden in order to identify skip lesions during the laser session and then uh, put la laser spots so we do not have any skip lesions. And by doing that, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that, that everyone can reduce the recurrence rate when doing laser. When it comes to anti-VGF, and I've listed the, the different anti-VGF um, drugs here, uh, we know that the babies have less myopia. Uh, there are still not good trials to show how the uh, visual field sensitivity is. I would like to stress that anti-VGF does not act only on the vascular tissue, but also neural tissue is, is dependent on VGF in order to develop. Uh, it doesn't have to be given under general anesthesia in all, in all settings. We do it in Sweden, but I know there are many countries that don't do it under general anesthesia. And we do know that the babies that do get uh, anti-VGF, that they have a high recurrence rate. Approximately one third of the patients will have recurrence. And we don't know really when it happens. Um, and we do not really know, not have very much control of long-term outcomes. The first publication came now uh, 10 years ago, and it was then said that uh, this uh, drug would not escape the eye and turn up in the circulation. Now we know better, we know that uh, it does, and especially that compound that was used by this time has an active uh, transport part of its anti-VGF to the bloodstream. So um, there have been um, several uh, publications regarding outcome and anti-VGF, comparing it with laser. However, most of them have used historical controls and there, I would say, is not a good study looking at long-term outcome uh, from a randomized trial. As we will hear, there are some coming up but today we do not have regarding neurocognitive outcome any good uh, randomized prospective trials. Um, in this publication from uh, 2019, it showed higher mortality and poorer cognitive composite scores in the Bevacizumab group. However, I would be careful looking at um, retrospective studies and the outcome of that. There was uh, a couple of years ago, a publication when a baby was giving anti-VGF and uh, uh, later uh, the baby had a neck uh, session. And this is uh, the, the levels of VGF in serum measured after uh, bevacizumab was given. And this is six hour post treatment where you can see that the levels of EGF drop dramatically. And it was suspected that this baby actually had neck uh, because of the injection. But of course that cannot be said for sure, but timely, it fitted very well. So, uh, there has been one large uh, study, the rainbow study, looking at which is a prospective study. It, uh, it was comparing two doses of Lucentis, uh, which is uh, the, the smaller molecule, um, which we know have a shorter half-life. Uh, and it was compared with laser. And the aim of this study was uh, to have the drug approved for this indication. And this study was performed in 2000, and it was presented in 2019. So uh, 
the drug had been used for many, many years of label. Looking at the outcome of this trial, the rainbow study, there was a non-significant result on the primary outcome. Uh, it was shown, uh, it was said that uh, Lucentis was efficient and tolerable, but we, there was one death in the, in the Lucentis group and one case of endophthalmitis. And when you have endophthalmitis in a preterm baby, the, the, the eye is lost. There is nothing you can do. And I would say for sure the baby becomes blind in that eye if you have an endophthalmitis. They also stated in this publication that VGF levels in plasma was not affected. And I, I guess this is true. And for that, the EMI approved ROP for this indication in October 19. Uh, I would like to spend uh, just uh, some, some words regarding measuring VGF levels in relation to ROP in preterm babies. And it has been discussed quite a lot uh, what um, media to use when you should measure VGF when it comes to cancer studies and tumors, uh, whether it should be measured in serum or plasma. And I would say it's totally dependent on the physiology you are interested in. And uh, looking at that, uh, I would like to stress, uh, there was a publication from India from uh, Professor Anand Binneker, who, who did show that there was a case with aggressive ROP that had a trom thrombocyte transfusion. And then the uh, aggressive ROP completely settled down and the baby did not need any treatment. And that uh, actually uh, um, made us very interested in looking at platelet levels and in relation to any ROP. And we did find that uh, the babies that had needed ROP treatment, not uh, only aggressive ROP, but any ROP treatment, that they had lower levels of platelets especially during the second phase of ROP. So that would be from week uh, 30 and onwards. Together with uh, Professor Louis Smith, we uh, performed an experimental part of the study where we actually gave mice platelets after they had been exposed to oxygen. And by doing that, we could see that the, the area of neovascularization was significantly reduced. And we could see that uh, that uh, one factor that contributed to that was that mRNA for VGF in the retina was uh, actually the expression of mRNA for VGF was uh, significantly less pronounced. So it seems that platelets are important for this disease. And we have shown that there is a correlation between platelet level and VGFs. So uh, we believe today that platelets are important for vascularization, neovascularization, and that they contain microvesicles uh, with VGF. So looking at VGF in these babies, we should absolutely measure the levels in serum and, and take the, the levels from the platelets into account. So by looking at different studies, uh, the results, whether we have an impact on VGF, circulating VGF in, in the blood or not, is quite dependent on in what system we measure it. Um, so I think that is the reason for uh, the study, the rainbow study, not to show any effect any uh, of, of plasma levels. Um, but maybe we have, would have a different result if we looked at the levels in serum, most likely, I would say. So this is uh, the, the third question. So now after 10 years of use, are there any pharmacokinetic studies available on anti-BGF in preterm infants? Yes or no?
So, 50-50. <laughs> well, I would say <laughs> that today we do not still don't have any good pharmacokinetic study. We still do not know the lowest dose that will give us efficacy. Uh, and I think, I'll, I'll see if I can, no, I have to do this again. Sorry for that, Professor. No, it's okay. If you can stand it, I can do it. <laughs> okay, so um, there was a Cochrane review, uh, 2018, which said stated that there are insufficient pharmacokinetic studies. We have no prospective long-term follow-up studies, and we do not know the systemic effects on different organ systems. So further studies are needed to assess this outcome. And I think this study, uh, led by David Wallace in, in the United States really reflects this whole problem. They are now performing an NIH funded study where they are down to 0.6% of the dose that was used in the first uh, study produced uh, or published in 2011. And that study is, is, it has been shown that this dose is as efficient. So uh, I think this really reflects the problem uh, when you introduce a new drug in neonatology uh, without doing proper pharmacokinetics to try to uh, titrate out the lowest possible efficient dose. Since this is a systemic exposure to these babies. Um, so, uh, I am very, very happy that the, the regulatory bodies now ask for long-term follow-up of the studies performed. And that is the rainbow study. It is also uh, the study uh, from Bayer, the Firefly study where ALEA has been uh, tested in, for this indication. And it is the low-dose Avastin study that I just mentioned. And actually, the first uh, publication from uh, the Rainbow Extension Study uh, was published uh, in August this year. And it demonstrated that the highest dose of Lucentis, that the babies that received that, that they had uh, less myopia than after uh, laser, 5% versus 20% after laser. And uh, they also looked at growth outcomes and respiratory outcomes, and they could not see any significant difference regarding these outcomes. So I think this is reassuring. We are still awaiting the, the neurocognitive outcomes. And uh, I'm very, very glad that, the, as I said, the regulatory bodies now ask for uh, long-term systemic follow-up of these babies. So by saying that, uh, what could be done today to prevent ROP? Well, of course, to... Uh, to uh, sponsor the mothers to breastfeed their children. And of course, nutrition of the mommy is important. It is also important to try not to have too much of a variability when delivering oxygen to the babies. And uh, think twice before you take a blood sample, or if possible, use micro methods. And naturally, infections lowering the platelets are not warranted, but that you know better than me. And of course, optimized uh, nutrition for the babies. I still believe we do not know the, the optimal way to nutrient a, a preterm baby. We are starting uh, on the tip of the iceberg to identify uh, certain uh, macronutrients that are important. However, the balance between these, I do not think that we are there to be, to have the, the optimal uh, composition yet, but it is a work that needs to be looked into more because yes, there are 
the, the, for instance, the fatty acids are important for neurovascular development that I think we have shown. So by saying this, I would like to thank you very much for listening. And uh, I would like to thank all my collaborators over the world and in Sweden. Thank you. Wow, that was an amazing lecture, Professor Anne. It was, I mean, it was, we, I mean, this was really one of the best lectures we have had so far in the series. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, shall we stop sharing and go on to the discussion part, if it's okay with you? That is perfectly fine. Okay. So, in a, uh, we, we will have a, a two-minute break of a video clip. After that, we will go on to the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, friends, now we have a uh, much awaited discussion coming up. To moderate today's uh, uh, discussion, we have two leading neonatologists of India, uh, Air Commodore Shamsher Singh Dalal, Professor AFMC Pune, uh, and uh, Professor L.S. Deshmukh, Government Medical College, uh, Aurangabad, India. So, Hearty welcome to you both for uh, the, to this session and thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this session. Over to you uh, for the ne next 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the Professor Anne's timings. I, I hope it's okay, ma'am. 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes is okay? Yeah. It's perfectly all right. Okay. So over to you, moderators. Kindly take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maravis. I would uh, like to compliment and thank you, Professor Khan, for an excellent presentation, very informative, very enlightening. Thank you so much. Also, thank I'd you. like to thank the organizers for selecting a topic which is very, very relevant to especially the pediatrician and neonatologists from India, where the largest number of prenatal babies are born. 
and the facilities for neonatal screening for ROP as well as treatments are not so widely spread and it's not so easily available. And secondly, to inviting Professor M for giving this talk on this topic, the true legend in the field of uh, ROP. Thank you. Now we'll, uh, as Professor Ann has said, I, and we all agree that we cannot 100% prevent ROP, but we can decrease the incidence to a great extent. And many of the strategies which Professor Ann has highlighted can be implemented in most of the NICUs by just improving the quality of care, reducing the iatrogenic blood loss, decreasing the variability in the SpO2 fluctuations, and early breastfeeding, nutrition, improving the nutrition of the mother are really, really implementable, easily implementable, but require lots of effort from the people working with the, with the new ones. With this, I will uh, just the few questions which I got from the participants. The first question is from Dr. Hamid. This question is some literature claim that there is an association between iron overload due to multiple RBC transfusion and ROP. What's your take on, on this, uh, Professor? I'm sorry, I did not capture the question. Yeah. What this question is uh, that there is there an association between iron overload due to multiple RBC transfusion and ROP. That means the effect of ROP uh, of RBC transfusion on ROP is it because of the iron overload or it just because of the presence of the adult hemoglobin which is causing more oxygen delivery? I th I think. Um... I, I really believe that it is the anem anemia that is causing the risk for ROP and not the transfusions in itself. That is my, um, my absolute conviction. Okay. But of course, there is, there is um, uh, where we have looked a lot at what happens when you transfuse the babies. And, and it really seems that the anemia pre-transfusion pre is the main risk factor. Okay, thank you, Professor Ann. The next question is, did you find any association between oral arachidonic and DHS supplementation and NEC? Increased risk of NEC, <coughs> your study? Increased what? NEC, necrotizing anthropolitis. No, 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 no. In fact, we saw a little less NEC uh, in the study, but it was not significant but it seemed as these babies have a little less of inflammation all over and, and that is sometimes goes with the neck, but we, we had a little less neck in the invention group. Okay, one another question from uh, Dr. Bharat. He says that officially we encounter babies with thrombocytosis in NICU. Did you look at the thrombocytosis whether these babies had lower incidence of ROP? With what? Lower incidence of ROP when? Increased platelet counts we encountered in babies. So did you find any association between increased platelet count with thrombocytosis and decreased risk of ROP in your study? No, no, we have not seen that. Okay, so uh, low platelet count has an association, but increased, uh, if I correctly, it's the no association. No, that is correct. But we are now starting to think that, um, and we are starting to, we have looked at that, that um, giving platelets from adults, might, the, that the platelets, adult platelets might not be the same as the fetal platelets. They might have completely different missions in, 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 in uh, the human. So, so it seems as the fetal platelets are more, into uh, maintaining vascularization and neural development, and not as much in clotting as the adult platelets. Okay. Dr. Anwar, one question from my side uh, on this of it. As you said, the, the, uh, some evidence is there that if, if, even if we give transfusion, female transfusion uh, donor, transfusion from female donor is found to be better 
Do you recommend yeah. that the mother's uh, blood uh, better than the other donors if the blood groups are matching? Um, if uh, I had a preterm baby, I would give them my blood. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I would also save cord blood to to give to them the full to full blood. But that is only uh, I must say this is more of, of a feeling thing than I can say that it is. Uh, I don't have scientific evidence other than that publication I showed you that that it seems as other morbidities benefit from from female cord. Um, called erythrocytes but um, I think it is interesting uh, and of course we understand that that uh, we have looked at different growth factors in plasma given and it is a huge variability depending on who has given the plasma and of course we know that but I think we will be more and more aware of of, of those things later on yeah, I just thought maybe mother uh, blood will have more growth factors uh, maybe exactly. transmitted across the placenta from the baby side or mother to baby side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a very prestigious professor in neonatology uh, 30 years ago who always gave the babies full blood from, from the core during the first week, one mil, I think. And um, that was his belief and they did okay. quite well. Maybe the delayed cord planting will help in uh, reducing the mm. delayed uh, and reducing yeah. the transfusions requirement. Yeah. Mm. For further questions, I'll uh, hand over to Professor Deshmukh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dalal. Good evening, everyone. Hi, and uh, thank you, Professor Ann, for this great presentation. It was very insightful. I mean, and you could compress so much of information in a span of 45, 50 minutes. And it was very aptly organized by the organizers for the pediatricians and neonatologists. You might be interacting with other uh, ophthalmologists, but for pediatricians and neonatologists, it was very enlightening for all of us to refocus on the ROP. Because what we have found recently of late in last five, 10 years in India, as the expansion of neonatal care to the peripheries at the district places is happening mm -hmm. through the government uh, programs as well as through the private uh, hospitals, more and more babies are surviving. And we are facing this extra burden of ROP, which is unrecognized. Mm -hmm. And now in India at district level, there are almost more than 700 SNCUs, which are called as sick newborn care units which provide level two care, where they manage babies with uh, oxygen and maybe CPAP, not ventilating, those units are not ventilating. Mm. But the biggest issue and biggest challenge for us all is screening the babies and not missing the babies, which is not happening at present. Mm. It is happening in bigger hospitals, in public hospitals, I'm speaking in some of the private hospitals, but it is not happening regularly. And as you know, India and China, they have largest number of births per annum. And we have very high burden of premature births and very high need of babies being needing this ROP screening and treatment. But on the top of that, ROP is such an area where very few ophthalmologists, forget about pediatric ophthalmologists, very few ophthalmologists are interested to look, uh, take a, become a ROP specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, by some recent literature and recent data, there are just around 200 retinas or ROP specialists across India. With such a huge burden, there is a dearth of ROP specialists but there are few initiatives which have happened over the last 5 10 years mm -hmm. with the use of uh, telemedicine or tele rop by the use of rate cam and uh, some uh, pilot projects were done and subsequently so some of the centers have adopted that model so some screening is happening and the, some specialist opinion is reaching to the peripheries mm -hmm. but uh, it needs a lot of improvement 
but your talk was focus more on prevention so that i appreciate very much second thing i appreciate is you focus more on uh, anti wedge therapy wedge up therapy which is also well appreciated and so wonderful lecture once again thank you ma'am i take up uh, next question we all know that fungal the sepsis is an important risk factor for rop so prevention of infection is key for prevention of rop but is there any difference vis a vis bacterial versus fungal sepsis in terms of risk of rop or risk of severe rop it it actually seems as fungal uh, is worse when it comes to the risk for rop and we do not know why but there are several publications and also we have data uh, from our group that shows that uh, fungal rop it seems uh, fungal sepsis seem to affect uh, biomarkers associated with severe rop more more severely so i don't know what it is but yes fungal is worse okay so we do face a lot of fungal sepsis and maybe we have to be very extra careful in those babies to screen and follow up them for longer period of time another question from shamna is are there any group of neonates in which uh, you recommend anti wedge up therapy up front like zone 1 aprop yeah absolutely you are fully correct and uh, i i i missed to stress that in my talk but there is definitely it has been shown uh, and i i i believe that if you have severe zone 1 disease anti vgf is needed it, it is for for some reasons uh, and one reason is that um, it seems that it is uh, a higher chance of not having retinal detachment if you give anti vgf than if you give laser and i think that is uh, that if you give a low dose of anti vgf you don't get a high rebound effect Uh, if you give laser you do get quite a severe inflammation and that might give a second uh, rebound another positive thing with giving anti vgf in in very uh, posterior disease is that um, we know that it usually takes at least a month to have a recurrence and during that time the vessels may grow a little bit further out in the periphery so if you need to treat with laser you will not destroy as large area of of the retina so uh, for sure in sweden if we have a severe zone 1 disease we always treat with anti vgf first as low dose as possible and lucentis uh, for sure uh, is preferred uh and uh, then we usually uh, wait but we do a second laser treatment um when we see that the vessels start to uh, uh, develop abnormally again um because if we wait too long we do it between a month 4 to 8 weeks after the first anti vgf treatment because to to be sure that we won't have a recurrence that we don't have control of and we want to to finalize the screening so the babies can can uh, go home and not to need yeah. to be screened yeah. every every once or twice a week for months and months that is not doable okay yeah and related question i just want to ask is uh, in uh, sweden or across europe is uh, lucentis preferred over the aventis or is there any head to head comparison Bevacizumab versus Ranizumab. It, it uh, um um Bevacizumab is not um is not uh, accepted uh, for ROP. So there is no um uh, indication for Avastin. Therefore Bevacizumab is the anti VGF drug given these days in in Europe mostly. is it always an unlicensed is it, is it still unlicensed and off label avastin is yes but not uh, not lucentis 0.2 mg that is still that is approved by ema for for uh, the indication of rop 
But are there any concerns with lucentis about crossing the blood retina barrier and uh, causing some more uh, problem with the neural development or cognitive development? Yeah, that those discussions has they have not ended. It's still ongoing, and um, there are several studies now coming up uh, regarding the rainbow study cognitive development. Everyone is awaiting that study to see if they could see any trend in, in outcome. Uh, we have looked a little bit at, at in our patient registry, and this is very preliminary data, and, and uh, I would not you know, be very, very sure about it, but it seems uh, that we do get a little bit of different outcome when we use laser and anti-VGF, and it might be that one causes more inflammation, the laser, and that might be more related to neuropsychiatric outcome. And maybe the anti-VGF is more related to neurocognitive outcome, but, but that is only a theory and a hypothesis. But we have to remember that they have different actions and different actions affect the brains in different manners. And I yes. think we right. will, we, in the end, we will see this, that it is not as easy as we would like it to be, but yeah. it might be that we get different yeah. outcomes Right. Yeah. So thank you for that. Dr. Dalal, can you take over? You are muted. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, Professor Ann. The next question is from Dr. Akash. What is the role of beta blockers in prevention of ROP? There are few studies which have shown that use of beta blockers has decreased the progression of ROP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a very nice, a good question, and I, I, we don't have the answer on it. But there are uh, some experimental studies uh, that has shown that uh, it theoretically could have effects. Uh, we uh, did an experimental study that did not show that. And now there is a uh, trial ongoing uh, with propranolol, uh, but it is given already in, um, in stage two. And as I showed on my natural history, a lot of those babies will never develop severe disease. Uh, and still these babies are given quite high doses of propranolol that we know affect the babies. Uh, and we know it may affect the brain development. So today I cannot say that it has effects. We know that propranolol has anti-angiogenic effects. We use it in ophthalmology when we treat hemangiomas. But uh, giving a, a development baby this drug, I think um, we do not have the answer. And the way the trial is conducted, I think it is... Um, given now too early if it if it will have effect it probably should be given when we see more severe uh, disease so that we won't expose as many babies to this drug but but i don't know i might be wrong and um, for sure we know that the drug has antiangiogenic effects uh, the question is how systematic uh, effects do we see and how how um, how good is it to prevent uh, treatment. So do you use in your practice or no? No, like no, 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 okay. no. The next question is that we know that the intermittent hypoxia has been associated with increased risk of parity, intermittent hypoxemia episodes. Yeah, yeah. And so which is more dangerous? Is the depth of the hypoxemia the degree to which the saturation falls or is the duration? Out of these two, is the duration of the hypoxemic episode is important or is the uh, decrease in the saturation which is important in our what in 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 our study, we, we uh, could see that it was not the duration of hypoxia, but rather the times that the baby had the saturations, that that was more important. I think every time you switch a tissue on and off, that is a risk. Uh, we know that um, harmony in the body is the perfect state. And uh, we could not see that the time of hypoxia was the strongest factor. It was times 
of uh, variability. That was the strongest risk factor. So do you think but that, that could it it could be different in different postmenstrual ages. With that we have not looked at. Okay, just a continuation of that. Now, few some data is coming in a retrospective that if you use lower saturation during initial few weeks of life, followed mm -hmm. by the higher saturation, yeah, uh, they are found to be better. So, do you recommend that we should start practicing like in Sweden? You saw when we started using the saturation of ninety one to ninety five, you had an increased incidence of ROP in your uh, country. Well, if I had heap of of uh, resources, uh, research money and and uh, research personnel, I would absolutely conduct such a randomized trial to give the the most immature babies lower lower uh, targets, and then when they come up to the second phase of RP or or when they are a bit about 30, 32 weeks, I would increase. I would not be afraid to increase the saturation. Unfortunately, those trials are not uh, have, haven't been done. Uh, there are some trials that have the one trial, the stop rope trial, that actually increased the oxygen levels when you started to see neovascularizations, and that did demonstrate uh, less severe ROP. So, if I have a baby that I'm treating, I, I tell the parents and the, the NICU personnel that don't be so afraid now to keep the babies a little bit higher. Uh, but this is uh, my clinical experience for many years, but, but I'm still awaiting the trial that, that actually can demonstrate this. But yes, you're, I believe you are on the right track. Thank you. Now, the next question is, what is the num maximum number of anti-VGF doses we can use? In one patient. How many times we can repeat the anti-VGF doses in case we are not seeing an adequate response? Or do you recommend that we uh, go for laser after first dose? Uh, if we have a very severe case in Sweden, we always start with anti-VGF, I would say, if it is a very central disease. Um, I think now, um, well, there are, of course, the, the, I also believe that the different compounds have different, um, as they have different half-lives, they might be different efficient. Um, in, I don't think we can say any number that is a maximum number. Uh, we, in, in my setting, we have never given more than two doses, but I cannot say that that is the maximum. I think that has to be judged by the treating ophthalmologist together with the neonatologist. Um, but I would always be to be, uh, I would like to be a bit reluctant because we know that it is in the circulation. If you give uh, 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 ranibizumab, it's probably in the circulation for a month. And uh, regarding bevacizumab, it is for a longer time. So um, I would be careful, but, and if it doesn't have effect, the first dose has, doesn't have effect uh, and not the second either, then I would of course go for laser because then I would not, I don't believe the third dose would have effect either. The another question is like uh, in India, we have seen that uh, ROP in the babies over uh, higher gestational age and birth weight. And because of that, our uh, NNF National University Forum is recommending screening baby up to 34 weeks and birth weight of 2,000 uh, grams. So what do you think is the reason that these larger babies or, or, or more gestational age and the more birth weights are developing out of India? Well, if I... I just guess it. I, I guess it is the oxygen is to be blamed because that is what we see from other settings. Um, I ha I have a difficulty in in understanding that it would be uh, nutrition or or inflammation. Of course, the mothers, some mothers of India might also not be so well nutriated, so that makes these babies a little bit uh, uh, more prone to have less vascularization later in gestation. Uh, that could be one reason, but I 
if I was to pick one factor, I, I would say that you should look into oxygen delivery in these babies. And the larger proportion of our babies are IUGR. Yeah, Inter exactly. So yeah. that may also be contributing. Yeah, yeah, that is what I think that we have seen that if, if the biomarkers that we know are associated with ROP, if they are really low at birth, then these babies have a hard time to catch up. Uh, so it's really a lot is decided already at birth. And that is why I think this algorithm I showed you works so well, because already at birth, we know what babies are at highest risk. And I think uh, we have to focus on those ones for, for the brain and the vascular development. Yeah, two more questions. Is it okay we continue? Yeah, Professor Desmond. Uh, thank you, Zala. So, uh, uh, continuing with our uh, questions, uh, is there any role of erythropoietin or IR in the development of ROP? If we give uh, I, erythropoietin I think... or maybe iron supplements, does it increase? Mm. Uh, I think with the erythropoietin, it's uh, it's dependent a little bit where in the face of ROP it it evolves. So I think it is again the reason for why we see increased levels of erythropoietin in some babies with ROP. It's because of the anemia that probably drives the increase of erythropoietin. So far, uh, it has not been shown that by giving erythropoietin you could decrease the risk of ROP. In fact, in some studies, it has increased ROP. And I think if you give erythropoietin later uh, at, at higher postmenstrual ages, I think definitely there is a risk for increasing ROP. Yeah, right. Just uh, another question related to oxygen targeting in your unit, in cases where I have established ROP. What are the oxygen targets? We, we don't change the targets. They are the same for every baby, independent of, of uh, ROP stage or gestational age and postmenstrual age. So uh, they are now between uh, 91 and 95, I think. It's the, they are following the boost criteria. Yeah, 91 to 95, yes, 90 to yeah. 95, right. 90. Yeah, so it is, it is same irrespective of the ROP status. Mm. Yeah, thank it's you. Just that I, I, it's just that I recommend the parents not to be so careful because most of the in, in most hospitals now the parents take care of the babies when they become a little bit older. So I just advise them not to be so careful to to put down the oxygen delivery to the to the babies, rather to keep it a little bit higher if yeah. I see that ROP starts to develop. Yeah. Even after treatment, laser or anti-VGF treatment, you maintain the same saturations or you alter? Uh, when we give anti-VGF treatment? Yeah, anti-VGF or after the laser therapy, do you continue the same saturations or different targets? Uh, no, no, the same saturations. Okay. So one more question. Uh, it's related to... I guess he is asking about hypoglycemia. If it is treated in extremely preterm babies, does it increase the risk of severe ROP? Because hyperglycemia uh, and hyperinsulinemia is one of the risk factors. Absolutely. That is uh, very much true. We have seen that hyperglycemia is associated with... Uh, with ROP. And also we know that in babies with hyperglycemia, they have lower low, uh, IGF-1 levels and they are mostly more IOGR babies. And it is, uh, the question is what is what? And uh, we know that some of the fatty acids are associated with, with the metabolism, the glucose metabolism. And um, I don't think we really, really know uh, what is what, but definitely we know that early hyperglycemia is associated with an increased risk. Yeah. Of our yeah. Right. So, one last question: 
Uh, what is your experience regarding neonatologists or pediatrician instead of ophthalmologists doing the screening with red cap? Um, in Sweden, it's mostly the ophthalmologists that do the screening, but we do have in some settings uh, neonatal nurses that do take the images and we look, the ophthalmologists look at the images. So I think this would be a good person that that take good images could be have any background actually uh, it's all about technique and uh, i think that the important thing is that is that the images are interpreted by a knowledgeable person uh, yeah. but that can be done right. from distance uh, a lot yeah. of this can be done from distance so i think it it's important to to educate someone who has an interest in in this uh, yeah. and then then anyone could actually do it yes, with yes. a good interest. Mm. In India, in many centers, optometrists are doing the screening. Mm. And the images are shared with the live or maybe shared subsequently and they are interpreted by specialists. Mm. Started with the pilot project of Kidrop and subsequently other yeah. ophthalmologists adopted that model. Mm. And it is working that... very well. So it needs a little bit of training and a trained optometrist mm. or technician can do that. Yeah, and, and what is in, yeah? I think that's very very good, and and we have to remember that the indication for for uh, treatment is really the central view if if the baby has plus disease or not, and and that can then it's not so difficult to take the images to get a good central image. Of course, we we would like to see the ridge, uh, but. Uh, I, I think this is a very, very good way to, to uh, have good screening to do take retinal images. Yeah, thank you. One last question before we finish, ma'am. Yeah, there is something called as hybrid ROP. Any comment on that? That terminology is recently being used. Hybrid ROP. That where is actually is a, the first time I hear a, this word. Yeah, that is what our ophthalmologists are telling that they are using this terminology in India because they are seeing cases where there is a plus features of plus disease plus fibrovascular bundle or scar somewhere. Simultaneously, plus 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 disease plus uh, fibrovascular ridge or proliferation. Okay. Uh, I, I must are... say that I feel a bit uh, uh, knowledge here because I, I this is not something that I've come across, the hybrid ROP. What, what is it a central disease with plus disease with fibrovascularization, you said? Not necessarily central disease, but plus disease with a uh, fibrovascular uh, ridge or proliferation. And that has been recently, that terminology has been used in operational guidelines also National Operational Guidelines of India, which were mm -hmm. published in 2018-19. Mm -hmm. So it's not stage three, it's more fibrovascular changes. Yeah, right. So would it be that the disease is has gone a little bit long when you actually find it? That yeah. it could have been there for... Yeah, they are, that might not have been picked up earlier. Yeah. Sounds then, because on on the description, it's it, I would if I saw such a patient, I would say that this has been uh, it's been too long standing. You should have treated this patient prior to this morphology. But I cannot not, say because yeah. I haven't seen it. Mm. Yeah, that is not surprising, but because the follow up is very erratic in many of the centers. Mm. But we do see a change, you know, in the ROP development. We see that we have to follow the babies longer for more than 40 weeks. We see that uh, in some babies, the vascularization actually does not reach the periphery. Um, in the most immature babies, we, we definitely see a, a changing picture of ROP. As, yeah. you, as you get better and you save more babies. So, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah, thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, and uh, thank you, Dr. Manoj. Over to you for the next part. 
as we keep on saying in most of our sessions all sweet things need to come to an end and then i, I would really apologize to professor han for keeping a longer than what we promised before we close this may we have the secretary of iap neonatology chapter dr rajesh kumar with us uh, dr rajesh are you there uh, for few words then we'll wind up the session okay thank you thanks ma'am thanks uh, professor han for nice lecture and uh, still we don't have answers about the whether the us avastin or sent in india and our uh, national neurology forum that is a body of neurologists in india it recommends avastin over lucentin and still we don't know that what dose we should use and still that it is a developing field i think uh, the lower dose will be a better option and in the future of the few studies will be clear about the dose what dose you should use and mm. uh, thanks again ma'am for the nice lecture thank you thank you thank you so much uh, now uh, we will close this session i have great pleasure in expressing our gratitude once again to uh, professor ann helstrom one of the legends in the in pediatric ophthalmology as well as now in neonatology we are all admirers of you thanks to the uh, work you have done in the last 20 20, 20 years and uh, it's a huge honor for us to have you in our forum ma'am I also would like to extend our uh, sincere and hearty invitation to you to join us for the uh, grand finale of this uh, series IAP Neocon scheduled from 10th to 13th. I will be contacting you personally for this man. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. I Bye -bye. Will, <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. I would also like to thank both the moderators. Uh, 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 the uh, air commodore shamsher singh dalal professor fmc and uh, uh, professor ls De deshmukh from aurangabad aurangabad for one, uh, d um, moderating the session so wonderfully so nice of you to keep the session so live even after exceeding half an hour so thank you so much both of you thank you uh, thank you bye bye Bye. And uh, at the end, let me thank all of you from all over the globe who has joined us and will be see watching this presentation in the next twenty four hours. We have almost seven uh, thousand plus registrations, and we are really truly honored to have you with us in this series. Now this is the forty third session. We uh, ho uh, hope to have the golden uh, jubilee in the fiftieth session, along with our grand finale that is in March. so i would invite all of you for that as well uh, on that note i would just uh, wind up with the invitation to join our next webinar that is on 23 december that is the christmas eve uh, thursday again the same time the to topic is uh, something we had discussed and left off in between because we are discussing preterm babies all this last two months and the, this is probably the uh, one of the last two last topics in preterm care neuro protection not the last least important but one of the topic that we have left out so far neuro protection preterm infants and to talk to us about this we have a legend uh, again professor kushin mohammed he was coordinating the and formulating the canadian guidelines for preterm uh, neuro protection he um, uh, he will be uh, talking to us on this so some of us who have been attending some other forums like the brain series the the, the two brain series the, the, uh, the various centers from canada have lost we have already heard his lecture so now he will be talking to talking to us about neuro protection preterm infants uh, professor kurshid mohammed from university of calgary canada on 23 december um, at 7:30 pm indian time until then a uh, th big thank you and uh, from all of us here in the team learn from the legends until we meet again thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am